being a person of color definitely has different challenges as well as opportunities in one's career. Access not only to basic things, potentially like broadband or technology, but also access to people and networks that, you know, that would that would bring you along or who might encourage you or teach you to follow a certain path in your life. Welcome to the debut episode of Be Bold. My name is Manoj Lianivas, Chief Operating Officer, Juniper Networks. This new series aims to go beyond technology, go beyond speeds and feeds, and instead focus on the people driving the technology and business innovation. Chris, I'm excited to have you on today's show. You have had an amazing career trajectory, starting from AOL, RSA, then going into Cisco, and eventually now at Microsoft. Walk us through your career trajectory. Um, thank you for having me with you. I have a pleasure to be your inaugural guest for your, your podcast. And I appreciate you taking on a, a challenging topic, you know, one that is top of mind for so many of us, but is certainly an incredibly important topic and you know, a challenge that we all got to go through and, and solve. You know, if you think about it, if I think about my own career trajectory, as you mentioned, you know, today I'm at Microsoft. I lead our business development, our strategy, our ventures teams. Spent a lot of my career. You and I know each other from, you know, me being in cybersecurity. Uh, so I've had a great career in and around that. You know, I will tell you, though, my first introduction to technology, it's kind of a little bit of a fun story. You know, like my I had a Commodore 64, you know, when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, for many of you who are, you know, over 45, you can relate to this. Uh, you know, this thing had a had a disk drive that was about a foot and a half long and six inches wide. It was a huge thing. Like a, I just remember this huge disk drive, huge CPU, monitor, keyboard, all separate components. Um, and I and I, you know, of course, like a young boy, I, I did a lot of you know playing games on it and things like that. But it was my first introduction to to technology. Uh, you know, sort of as we know it, you know, today. And I, you know, learned to program in basic on the machine. And, you know, you can you know, write little, you know, write, you know, little different, you know, you know, pieces of code. It was a different, very different than what we were used to, you know, having like, like the 3.5 inch or actually the five and a half inch floppy disks in, uh, in those days. And I will tell you, um, it, it got me sort of interested early on in technology. And look, in my house, man, like, I remember this, like literally that computer sat in the middle of our living room. I grew up from Cleveland and there was no other furniture in the living room. And like that, like, but that was a priority that got made at some point in time in my family's journey. And I'm thankful for that. Um, and, you know, when you start talking about, you know, diverse workforces and people coming from underrepresented communities, think of that image of the kid in his or her living room with maybe all they've got is an opportunity to have a machine if they've got that opportunity. And so those are some of the things that we're up against as we you know, seek to tackle leveling the playing field for people from a variety of different backgrounds uh, in tech. You know, this is fabulous to hear that we are both dating ourselves, you know, the Commodore technology. Uh, what was that, you know, do you remember that specific age when you said like, this is it for me, you know, I'm going to go down this path. This is, this is it. Was it like very early, you know, you know, before your teens or was it in the teens, you know, can you give us an idea of when? I think when I had that Commodore, I want to say I was probably, I don't know, I definitely wasn't in my teen. I think I was early, maybe preteen age at that point. Um, but, you know, there was never a, like, I would, for me, there was never a seminal moment where I was like, okay, I'm going to go be in tech. I mean, I, you know, back when, you know, when I was when I was growing up, I, I wasn't sure what sort of career opportunities would be available to me. And like I literally didn't know anyone in a technology career when I was growing up. I mean, most of the people I knew were working people and they worked in, you know, manufacturing plants. Mm -hmm. You know, they worked in offices, schools you know, you name it, they were service people, many of them. So, you know, my father was in manufacturing, my mother was, uh, you know, she worked in a hospital. 
uh, as an admin. So I didn't know I didn't know anyone until much later in my life, till probably college, that was actually in tech, like that wrote software or did anything with with technology. But, I mean, and that was a different time too. I mean, we're talking about many, you know, many many years ago at, at this point in, in time. And so things things have changed. But growing up, I didn't have access to to these kinds of career, you know, these sort of career opportunities, and so therefore. You know, when I had a Commodore 64, I wasn't thinking, oh, wow, there's this great career that one could have as a developer. Um, and, and but over time, you know, after college is when, you know, that kind of that sort of set of opportunities really started to open up for me. You bring up a very good point. I mean, in those days, there were different industries and tech wasn't actually in the forefront, right? You got interested in computers, you got interested in, you know, how things come together, you know, in an automated fashion, and then you applied the two together, right? But these days, things are different, right? You know, tech is right in forefront of everything, right? Your company, Microsoft, Apple, all these companies are what people, you know, kind of thrive to be part of, right? And when you're growing up, they see all the equipment and the gadgets they're playing with. So tech is a little bit more forefront to everybody, including everybody in the you know, underrepresented communities. But still, tech is not a go-to career you know, from an underrepresented community point of view. How, we, how can we look at getting people to embrace this as a go-to career, uh, especially if you look at the, the, uh, the communities in the minority? You know, I think it starts, Manoj, early in, like I think we need to start early in the life cycle for a lot of people, you know, as children, you know, look, the reality is, and this is from some of our own work, you know, we estimate that like in the U.S. alone, there are still nearly like, about 14 and a half million households that don't have access to broadband, to broadband, right? Something that we all take for granted, you know, we in Silicon Valley all take for granted uh, in our lives. But there's just, and, and, and unfortunately, as you pointed out earlier, it's underrepresented minority communities that are disproportionately represented in that 14 and a half million household number. And so, you know, first thing we've got to do is level the playing field. In fact, it's one of the reasons why Microsoft actually, we actually have a, a broadband initiative to try to bring broadband into communities that don't have access because it starts very early. Like if you don't have access to technology, if you don't have access to, you know, to the internet, if you don't have access to the cloud, it becomes much, much harder for you to get on the path of a, of a career in that direction. That's the hard part. And that's a, that's a part of the work that needs to be done. And then from there, how do we make sure the curriculum in schools is such that people who are in a variety of different school environments have access to education that would set them on the path for a career in technology. And that's at all levels, right? That's, you know, primary school, that's secondary school, high school, and then obviously on to college and making sure that we have education, we have skilling available so that people can, you know, sort of people have as much access to, you know, sort of learning how to code, for example, as they might to learning how to type when they're in high school. Like I remember taking a typing class when I was in high school, but, you know, why, why wouldn't we make sure that, you know, sort of develop, you know, sort of learning how to code is something that's as sort of part of it or considered as much part of our educational experience as learning how to type or, you know, learning math, reading, science, you know, any of the other subjects that we expect in, in our early educations. It's like, so I, I would say it starts with the foundation. And then obviously, as, as people get older, as people move through the, the educational process, making sure that there's avail you know, availability for people to learn and then on ramps into technical careers, uh, because clearly we've got a need. There's so much demand for technology, you know, people in technology careers that we're not meeting, certainly not meeting with people who are, you know, are born and raised here in the U.S. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity for so many, you know, so many people. Look, my own, you know, sort of the, the place I spent a lot of my career in cybersecurity, you know, we're, we always, you know, there's, there's literally millions of jobs that are not filled today. And, and there will be millions of jobs that don't get filled over time because people don't have access to education about it. They can't get the, the right skill sets. And uh, that's a problem we got to solve. 
Well said, Chris. Uh, if I summarize you, I think I heard two aspects. One is access, which all of us can do something about it, whether it's a Microsoft, whether it's a Juniper, whether it's a Cisco, whether it's an Apple, all of us can do something about that, right, for changing that. The second thing is the curriculum, having more emphasis on things like, you know, uh, programming, maybe even cybersecurity, elements like that, so people get a little bit more better exposure about things just like math and physics and everything. So the combination of the two. Well said, Chris. I'm going to take you down a different path now. I think uh, you graduated from Princeton, if I remember correctly, and then you had an MBA from Howard Business School, and then you are this like brand new kid getting into the first job out of you know all these wonderful accomplishments you've done in education, getting into your first job. So, what was your first job? You know, out of college, and like how was the how did you how did the cultural embracement happen in that first job? You know, from your perspective. You know, my, my first job, actually, I was a I was a consultant and, um, you know, there was a little bit of, of tech work. It was more mathematics and, and you know, statistics and, and analytics in those days than, than writing code. Uh, it wasn't actually until a little bit later when I ended up founding a company. I founded a company called Cyvalence with, you know, a number of my colleagues from that consulting firm. And that's really what sort of got me going. In uh, in technology, you know, again, that's uh, you know, in today's world, it's very normal to to do a startup when you're young. Uh, in those days, that was a little bit, and I was on the East Coast in those days. In those days, that was a little bit unique. You know, that wasn't something that a lot of people were doing, but it was it was a tremendous amount of fun. And uh, you know, that was my first foray into technology. Um, we also were a cybersecurity company, which at the time. It wasn't called cybersecurity. I always tell people that it's like I'm one of the few people you'll meet who's actually been in cybersecurity longer than we've actually called it cybersecurity because we used to call it IT sec or infosec. Um, but you know, those are but you know, any industry has that story where there's origins that you know take on you know different meaning over time. And and uh, you know, obviously today cybersecurity is a it's a it's a much different part of our you know, our diaspora in the techno landscape and certainly a, a huge thing that a huge topic area for companies of all types at this point. Fast forward now, you know, from those days, you know, those beginnings where you were just getting involved in technology, um, cybersecurity, I think it looks like you're a cybersecurity person at heart, right? From the beginning and you're still a strong cybersecurity advocate. Uh, and now fast forward all the way to Microsoft, you are leading one of the top companies in the world in terms of where the company is looking at from a strategic direction, you know, what are the areas to develop? I mean, it's a role very few people in the world can ever even dream to be, you know, driving in such a role, you know, and when I look at the comparison of your trajectory, I mean, what were the important things which helped you figure things out to build your career towards here? Is there a secret sauce which you can share with all of us? You know, a couple of things that are, I think are really important that, that, you know, I have gotten, I got advice on this early in my career. One of the most important things to think about when you're developing a career is to, not think of your career as a linear function that goes up and to the right. Um, I have always thought of my career as a little bit more like a tapestry or a mosaic where you need to gather different experiences that suit you wherever you may be in your journey. And you have a general perspective on where you want to go in your career, but be willing to do things that are going to teach you um, be willing to take on opportunities where you're going to learn. And, you know, ultimately, after you step back from the, the career, it's a, the picture becomes more clear. And I think a mistake some people make is that the, because you, when you pick up when you're earlier in your career, you just come out of school, right? And that is a linear function that goes up and to the right. You know, you go from grade to grade to grade, you go from high school to college and you go through and then you get a job. And, but, but once you reach the work world, it's a little different. And, you know, while you want to push yourself and achieve, it's you, you need to make sure you're, you're learning, you're taking on new challenges, you're building your skill set, you're building your networks. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, there is a there is a factor of being in the right place at the right time that certainly matters in anybody's life or their career. Um, you know, certainly there's a, the effort you put, it's like anything else in life, the effort you put into your career 
uh, you will, you know, it, it, it correlates to, you know, in a big way to what you get back out of it. You know, but for me, I've tried to focus on learning along the way on taking on new challenges. Sometimes I've taken on challenges that other people um, might not have been interested in taking on. Um, I'll give you, a, here's a good example. Early in my career, uh, I took an assignment to go to, this, this is, I had never been out of the country after college, never been I, from Ohio, didn't go out of the country, except for maybe like Niagara Falls or something like that. And if you're from Ohio, that's like around the corner. Um, but I took an assignment to go to Korea earlier in my, early in my career. And I remember being on the plane with my manager at the time. And, uh, he said, he said, uh, oh, um, you know, how's the flight so far? Are you excited about the, 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 the project we're going to go do? And I said, yeah. And I just got my passport and I'm really excited. And he looked at me like in shock and, and, he he, I, he said, what, "What do you mean? Has, did you get a, did your passport expire?" And I said, "No, I actually just got my passport. I've never had one before until now. I was an adult when I got my first passport, and and but you know I went there, you know, tackled that assignment. But it but I did it because I wanted to get a different perspective. Nobody told me I had to go do it. Um, no, you know, nobody specifically asked me. I said, "Hey, I want to go do something internationally because." You know, again, like in today's world and for like my children, going to do something internationally will be like, um, like it's not even a thought. They just, that's what they would do. Um, but considering where I grew up and what I knew about, like it, like it took my sort of initiative to go get that done. And everybody's got their own story. That's mine. Um, but it just, it's an example of, you know, going and trying to do something early on that I thought would pay benefit to me. And not only did I, I learn a lot, I had a ton of fun. Um, you know, people thought, you know, people thought it was, you know, it was great that I, I took on that. And then, and then that, you know, that opens up other doors and, you know, those are the kinds of the, of decisions that you need to make in your career and your life in order to, to, you know, to follow the journey that you want to follow. And that's, you know, that's one of my stories I would share. I love the way you said tapestry in terms of your career trajectory, looking at different pieces and, you know, not looking at the things in a linear fashion, but always, always, most importantly, you were learning and adapting and trying, willing to try new things, right? And whether it's, you know, taking an international trip and go take a assignment far away from where you've been for the rest of your life or, you know, taking up a new opportunity in a new company, I think. So there is a definite amount of risk taking as well as, you know, finding a true north through that tapestry in many ways. That's very, very, very profound to hear. Um, a slightly different question on the same path, right? You know, you reach this, you know, amazing, you know, it's probably the pinnacle of your career or there's much more to be had for you, but, this is such an amazing position you are in. And as a person of color, uh, how, how did you find things for you? you know, how, was it easy? Was it difficult to navigate? Was it, um, you know, it, it was completely in you to do whatever obstacles you had, how to overcome that? Is there a, a certain aspect you can share with us in terms of that journey? You know, it, you, you bring up an important point, Manoj. You know, being a person of color, definitely has different challenges as well as opportunities in one's career. And so some of those challenges and opportunities are related to the topics we were speaking about earlier, access being one, um, sort of, and, and interesting sort of access, not only to basic things, potentially like broadband or technology, but also access to people and networks that, you know, that would that would bring you along or who might encourage you or teach you to follow a certain path in your life. So that's a really important piece of it. Exposure is important, right? You don't, how do you know what careers to pick if you don't know those careers actually exist? And as a child, like you learn, you, you get exposed to different things. And over time, you can you can make better choices about what may or may not be available to you. And generally speaking, this isn't true for everyone, but you know, un, like people of color generally aren't in all the same networks that, you know, would lead them into careers in technology, careers in cybersecurity. And so this is where we have work to do, right? We have work. This is back to educational opportunities. This is back to 
Where do companies like Microsoft or Juniper recruit for people you know, to come join the company? Once people join the company, how do you create opportunities inside the company for people to thrive and do their best work? How do you create networks of familiarity that help people be comfortable and do their best work? Here's an important, you know, here's a, a story I would share or an example in my own life that I would share that's helped me. You know, when I went in, when I went in my first job, you know, I, I, you know, there, there weren't a ton of, of other, there weren't, there were a few others, but just a few other African Americans at the same firm that I joined when I got out of college. However, there were a lot of Princeton people, a lot of people who had gone to Princeton before. So what was interesting is while I didn't have a network necessarily to rely on that was robust of, of other African Americans, I had a big Princeton network and that matters. Um, now think if you're the if you're the sole African American somewhere, and you went to maybe a college or a university that wasn't a mainstream, you know, sort of recruiting bed for the company you join, you might feel a bit isolated. And this this is a good example of, you know, we need to when we we don't we, we can't just focus on who we're recruiting to an organization. We have to make sure that once we recruit someone and they're an underrepresented minority that we also are thoughtful about the networks that they'll have, the support systems that they'll have once they arrive at a company so that they'll get the opportunities. If things, if they need to learn something, who do I, who do I ask questions of when I'm, I'm not sure about something? Because everybody, you know, regardless of your, the color of your skin or your gender, um, you, you, you're going to have questions, you're going to have challenges, but the people who, who thrive are the ones who are able to tap into their networks. They're able to get answers to their questions. People give them a helping hand along the way. And we shouldn't take those things for granted because they're not, that playing field for everyone isn't level. And it's not necessarily unlevel because somebody chose to make it that way. Some of it's historical. Some of it's, some of it is because of just the way organizations have been formed over time. But, you know, one thing that we can all do is work to level that playing field. So you sort of exposing that in, in conversations like this so that, you know, as we build our, our systems, as we recruit people, as we bring them into our companies, you know, look, you're a leader at your company, you know, like one, 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 one thing you'll do is go reach out to somebody to help them along because they'll seek, seek you out as a leader who can, who can help them in their career. Like, but these are all things that we all have to do individually, but systemically it's, it's very important as well. Yeah, you covered a lot of topics there in terms of, you know, getting people empowered to come into the workplace and thrive, right? You know, how do we provide a, a system where there's mentorship, there is a support system to, you know, for people to kind of engage so that they can thrive in that environment. I also love that example you gave, right? You know, when you, when you started, uh, you know, you were the first sort of African-American in that community, you know, in that company you joined, but there were a lot of other Princeton folks. So you used the challenges and opportunity, right? In many ways, right? You know, okay, I could use the tap on the Princeton network and then build on, right? So in many ways, I think for every challenge, there is an opportunity for every cloud, there's a silver lining, right? I think again, your, your approach to life comes through there too, right? You know, what you mentioned earlier about your tapestry, you're looking at, you know, not a linear path. And you can always look at the possibilities and it's for you to take advantage of that. But as the uh, rest of us, we need to provide that, you know, support system for people who are coming, you know, coming in, in a sort of a diversified environment and give them the ability to grow and thrive. So that's, that's great. I, I'll tell you that I did some homework on you. Uh, you know, I know you, you and I know each other for quite a long time, but I did a little bit of reading up on your, you know, profile and whatnot. And recently I kind of noticed a couple of aspects, right? One is the philosophy you kind of, you know, leaning, leaning forward on in terms of leadership agility and also inclusive, inclusive leadership, right? The combination of leadership agility and inclusive leadership. So that seems to be something unique you're bringing to the table and, you know, something which you are kind of, your passion also coming through very clearly there. Would you want, would you want to share something about that, uh, especially in the context of this diversified workforce? Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I, um, leadership is, is, is changing. Like, like as we speak, you know, the, the requirements of leaders are, are changing. They're in flux. I mean, we, the environment around us is changing. The expectations of leaders are changing. You know, the, the, the speed of innovation and change in, in our industry 
is only increasing. That puts different requirements on us as, as leaders. And so, yes, I believe in a few elements of leadership that I think are, are important. And this is certainly not exhaustive, but you know, I do believe it's important to be inclusive in your leadership style. I mean, look, the, you know, companies need, and, and this is this is something that that's proven over and over again, is that you know, leaders who find ways to create inclusive environments for people with different points of view, backgrounds, um, and 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 all in different, just diverse perspectives, are going to are going to ultimately deliver better results, all of the things you know, being reasonably constant. Um, I also believe very much in, in servant leadership. You know, I, I believe that you know, the best leaders, and there's, there's, there's good leaders who may not consider themselves servant leaders, but I think the best leaders are very servant leader oriented in the sense that they, they focus on putting others out in front. They, po- they focus on how they build up other people around them and they focus less on themselves. It's about the organization. It's about the team. Um, it's about how can I remove roadblocks and obstacles for others, as opposed to what you know, sort of what can I do for you, as opposed to what can you do for me. Um, and that's you know, I think I think you know, I I've had the the privilege of working for as well as with a number of great leaders, and I will tell you the ones who had that mentality really are the ones I think have found the ways to unlock the best in their people and their organizations uh, and do it in the right way. I work, I work for one right now. He's a, he's, he, that's who he is as a leader. And, and obviously none of us would argue that he's one of the best at, at what he does. Um, you touched an important point about teamwork makes everything happen, right? Uh, you know, if you can enable your team to thrive, you know, you're doing a fantastic job as a leader. I think that's what you said. Talking about inclusive leadership, which you touched on, you know, to to kind of encourage this, uh, you know, what are some of the skill sets, uh, you know, people need to have to evolve to this kind of leadership, which you're referring to? I think one, you have to hold yourself and your organization accountable to be inclusive. Um, And that's, you know, inclusivity is a set of behaviors, right? It's cultural. Uh, And, you know, culture is something that you drive. It's, I mean, it's, It'll happen to you if you don't sort of actually actually work on your culture. But I think in- inclusivity is a, is a cultural element, and part of that is how you operate as a leader. It's what you expect um, in terms of you know how you show up at meetings, how you personally act, include people in uh, you know sort of in interactions, you know in various ways. Those can be formal, they can be informal. It's rewarding others for you know having the courage to and the bravery to, to speak and speak up when, when needed. I think it's about making sure you have the right representation, sort of, it's hard to be inclusive if you don't have anybody there to include who's, who's from a diverse background. So representation of, of folks from a diverse background is really, really important. And, you know, a good example of this is that, you know, you've got to, you know, rep- in order to get the right amount of representation, just given the natural uh, or the I would say the existing state of tech requires that you have goals around you know sort of bringing people in from different backgrounds. Um, but much to the conversation you and I have been having here, it's not just about uh, representation. It's about you know getting you know helping people thrive and grow because you can you can recruit people to an organization earlier in career or later in career. But if you don't, but but you also then have to provide mechanisms, support systems that allow them to thrive so that they grow their careers and they can become highly contributing members to the organization. And then that, you know, sort of that ability to thrive begets others like them who are able to thrive. And that's really when you know that your leadership style is inclusive, when you've created an environment, not just where people will sign up, but where they stay and they do well and they're part of the success of the organization. Very well said, Chris, because you're talking not just about recruitment of people, you're talking about how to make them thrive. And you as the leader providing that environment where they can thrive, right? And most importantly, you also talked about the accountability part, measure what matters, right? If you're going to aspire to something, hold your organization responsible for it and you yourself hold yourself accountable to it. So that is very well said. Uh, in kind of closing out, I mean, we are living in a very interesting time. Once in a hundred year, 
pandemic. Uh, you know, look at you know recession. You know, you know, kind of peaking at us from <laughs> from somewhere. Inflation at a multi you know four decade high right now, and a raging war too. Right, it's a very very different place than you know some of us are used to in the last you know two decades or so. Uh, in this changing world, you know, for technology professionals, do you have an advice on how we can help make the world a better place? You know, I think technology is actually one of the, the ways in which we can work our way through the challenges that we have today, Manoj. And so in some ways, I think we have a unique challenge and opportunity as technology leaders to lead through what we're doing now. Like, like Microsoft, our mission, like this is one of the things I do love about Microsoft. I joined during the pandemic, but our mission is to help, you know, every person and organization on the planet achieve more. And you know, if you think about the role that technology companies, us, Juniper, many, many others included, played, certainly in the early part of the pandemic when everybody went immediately remote, the cloud, our tool sets, video capabilities, you know, that allowed us all to keep working in a way that you know, was trying to keep people safe, right? So they could be at home, they could be distributed um, you know, in, in many ways. The, the capabilities that were provided by our technology companies were really, really important to our ability to navigate through the pandemic. Now, if you look at what we're facing today, inflation, um, you know, labor market challenges, like you say, conflict in, in, uh, in Europe, you know, we've now, the opportunities we have are, are they're changing, right? And now it's about how do you improve productivity? How do you help organizations move quickly? How do you help organizations be more agile to meet the needs and the challenges that we face, seen as well as unforeseen that we'll get to um, in the future? You know, cybersecurity, near and dear, you know, you and I both share that as, as, a, as an element of, of what we care a lot about. And, you know, for example, you know, Microsoft played a role in, in the protection of critical infrastructure in the Ukraine, you know, throughout the early parts and, and, and you know, ongoing in the conflict that, that's happening with Russia. And so, you know, that's the kind of role that technologists can play. You know, there may be a very direct role, like, you know, protecting critical infrastructure during a war, like Microsoft's doing today. Um, and then there's also the longer term elements of how do we leverage the power of the cloud, you know, to help organizations move faster, be more agile, cut costs. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I think those are all some, those are all the kinds of things that we can do uh, as technology companies. And the last thing I'll say is, it's back to a little bit of something you said a, a while ago, which was technology is a much more integrated aspect of our lives, certainly than it was when, when I was growing up or when you were growing up. And we have an opportunity to shape uh, trends, we have an opportunity to be part of, to lead the change that we want to see, and uh, you know I think we need to take that responsibility very seriously. Not just you know delivering product, but helping to make sure that we're good stewards of the technology. That we you know as we bring new capabilities to bear, we do it in the right way with the right principles, you know that help people thrive and and become you know sort of a leg up for society, not something that's a challenge. Chris, there were a lot of thoughtful comments through this entire conversation. Thank you for spending the time with me. You are always a class act. You're welcome back anytime. Have a great day. Manoj, thanks very much. I, my pleasure. Great to talk to you as always. And uh, uh, happy to be the first, uh, first guest. Thank you.